Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. It's a super mini mail call episode, and I hope everyone is doing well today. This package comes from Nura in Finland, so hi to all my Finnish viewers. I think I've mentioned this before, but Finland is definitely on the list of countries that I really, really, really want to go to. I was planning a pretty big trip, I think it was last year, or maybe it was two years ago, and I was going to end up in Spain, but I was actually going to go through Helsinki on the way and was trying to angle myself where I could have like a stopover of a night or two there in Helsinki and maybe be able to explore Finland a little bit, at least that part of Finland. And unfortunately, it didn't work out. Or maybe this was two years ago, kind of during COVID, and some of the flights got canceled. And in the end, I, you know, got everything refunded and whatever. But uh, that was a bit disappointing because I was really looking forward to at least having a little taste of Finland on that trip. I'm slowly figuring my way into this box. <laughs> it's very, very well sealed. Uh, it did have a security sticker on it, so I assume it went through some type of an x-ray machine on the way to me. But there we go. We are in the box now, and there's a note. Let's see what else we have going on here. Oh, all sorts of cables and goodies. Who doesn't love goodies, honestly? All right, I think that is everything from the box. Let's take a look at the note. And I think I already know what this is. And it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty darn cool. Hi, Adrian. Greetings from Finland. In this package, you'll receive an absolutely hilarious amount of packing materials. <laughs> I give the contents a best ch possible chance to survive the perilous travel across the oceans. Buried somewhere deep inside lies a piece of the finest vintage Canadian computer hardware. As I didn't want to fill the entire remaining volume with even more packing material, I figured I'd include some other items which you'll hopefully find useful, interesting, or amusing. The HAC-2 joystick is a personal project of mine with the goal of designing an open source and 3D printable joystick for retro computers. It attempts to combine my favorite features from both the Sun Suncom TAC-2 and the Kempston Competition Pro, a very famous joystick. I have a few of those floating around. This one is printed with Teal Pet G and is the first complete unit I've built. It's disassembled to make it better to fit in the box, but is quite simple to reassemble. Next up, the Pico Post is a project by the RetroWeb to produce a modern software-defined postcard for ESA or ISA bus-based computers. It repurposes the SATA cable to pass data over the I2C to an external remote with an OLED screen and buttons for navigating the UI. I've included both a unit I've pre-built and a set of blank PCBs. That's freaking cool. Pico means the Raspberry Pi Pico. And this right here is an early version of the Pico Gus, which is incidentally now available for purchase. It's an open source project that actually replicates the entire Gravis ultrasound inside the Pi Pico and then uses this rather high quality digital to analog converter to output 3.5 millimeter stereo audio. In addition, of course, since it's a Pi Pico, it's a software-defined card, which means that this can also emulate other types of sound cards, like Tandy Sound, or the Creative Lab CMS system, Creative Music system, or an AdLib card, for instance. And there's more coming for this, including like the original Sound Blaster. I made a video about this on the main channel, and I absolutely adore this project. And the Pi Pico is in the similar vein to this, where it's using a Pi Pico, but to create this post analyzer card. And I've heard about the Pico Post because when I was on the Discord for this card, the Pico Gus, and the Pico Mem, which is a similar card to this, which I've also shown on a previous mail call episode, uh, that, that card, by the way, is uh, Pi Pico as well, but it's for an XT, and it emulates a disk drive, a hard drive, it adds EMS memory, it adds RAM, it does a whole bunch of stuff like that with its own BIOS interface and everything, all with a very inexpensive Pi microcontroller. And um, the folks in there were talking about the Pico Post, and I thought that is really awesome. So that is really cool to be able to play around with that, which we'll do in this video. Let's go on in the letter. We have other bits and pieces. Modern DRAM replacement for the 64. I've heard of these, and I've never seen one myself, but it replaces all of the DRAM chips with, I think, a single SRAM chip on this PCB that sort of plugs into the board where all the old chips are. It just allows you to get rid of those chips if you don't have access to more of them. Um, got this with the intention of using it for my 60 clone build, but ended up using actual 4164 RAM chips anyways. Uh, SATA to IDE adapter, accidentally bought an extra one. Oh, you know, that's kind of useful because the other day I was going through my stuff and I found this Samsung uh, SSD here, which I tested and does work 250 gigabyte 850 Evo. 
And I was thinking that the retro computer I have back behind me there uses a compact flash card, has Windows 95 on it, and it's a little sluggish at times. And it would be pretty sweet to replace that compact flash card with solid state storage like this. And then this will be far faster than the compact flash card that's in there. That's one of the issues with the compact flash cards. While they're solid state and they're not terribly slow, they're not great when there's a lot of small files. And Windows 95 has a lot of small files. So it's kind of sluggish on a machine that it should run decently fast on. So SATA to IDE would be pretty useful. Okay, other stuff here is an assorted extra PCB from uh, stuff I've ordered for myself. So that's kind of cool. I have a box full of those types of things myself. Stickers. And then finally, the star of the show. Let's flip that up there. Yes. <laughs> the thing that inspired me to send this package, uh, actual Gravis Ultrasound Max Revision 1.8. This is basically the classic Gus, but with the optional 16-bit recording daughter board and CD-ROM interface included on the single board. It has 512K of sample RAM by default and has been upgraded to one megabyte. Yeah, wow, that's obviously what's in here. And that is unfreaking believable Believe it or not, and I think I mentioned this when I did the video on the Pico Gus, I don't have a Gravis Ultrasound. I have one of those interwave boards, those more modern ones, I think it was a compact board. And with the right firmware, you can kind of get it to be an ultrasound. But that board was such a pain to get running, and I did get it working once, and that was also a donation from a viewer. So thanks very much for that, but it was so difficult to get working that I basically Got it working, tested to see it, it, was, it did work. And I was like, okay, I'm putting this away because I don't want to deal with this disastrous driver situation with that interwave card. Meanwhile, the classic Gus boards on the other hand are actually easy to use. But if you go look online, the price of these boards is just completely freaking bonkers, which is why I think the Pico Gus is such an amazing product or uh, concept really because you can get, I mean, this thing really does emulate the Gravis ultrasound in pretty much every way perfectly. And it does it for, I think Ian sells these for like 60, 70 bucks or something like that, fully assembled. But like I said, it's open source. So you can just go download the schematics and the plans and whatever, and just make your own if that's what you want to do. These are all commodity parts on here. Nothing is hard to get. So yeah, go ahead, make your own. If you don't want to spend the money or just buy it right from Ian. And sorry, Ian, if I've quoted the wrong price. But anyways, when uh, Nora reached out to me and was like, oh, I have a lot of Gravis ultrasounds and I'd like to send you one. Of course, I wasn't gonna say no to that because it would be really cool to, especially helping Ian because I've run into some issues, well, testing this board on some of my motherboards because I have a lot of motherboards and I've found some that didn't work quite right. And it's hard to know if that's a problem with this or the real Gravis ultrasound would also have the same issue. Case in point, I ran into a weird compatibility issue with this card running the second reality demo when in combination with an XT IDE card, the 8-bit version actually prevents the demo from working properly. It crashes, but it does it in weird random ways on different motherboards. Well, it turns out that it's a compatibility issue between the XT IDE itself and this card, but it's not just this card because Ian, who does have a real Gruss card, tested and it also screws up on the real card as well. So that'll be kind of cool to be able to test some of that stuff when I'm helping Ian try to troubleshoot issues um, with this card. And I've been talking to Ian, by the way, about new firmwares for this to do other things, like how about SID emulation for the PC? Yes, it is possible, and other stuff as well. So yeah, it's such a cool and exciting card. Anyhow, back to the letter here. Yeah, the original manual and ultrasound experience CD, which contains the 411 ultrasound software also included. If you're going to use the board with the same software installation as the PicoGus, remember to set the Ultra 16 environment variable. See the manual to enable Ultra Init to detect the card. Oh, I'm just like completely blown away. I just, I still can't believe I have a real Gravis ultrasound. Now, I think I mentioned this in my PicoGus video. I had a real ultrasound back in the day. I bought one of the original red color PCBs. Um, I don't know what color this one is, to be honest. Let's open this up and take a look. This thing is uh, double, triple wrapped here. I don't think this is the one I had. No, this isn't. The one I had, I don't think had a CD-ROM interface. And I kind of remember it had like RAM chips over here in this area or something. Not quite sure, but I had that card. And I bought it when it was new. And I remember being completely amazed by it. And I was really into the demo scene. So that was really one of the reasons why I got that card. But I was also really frustrated by the fact that 
it really had very junky Sound Blaster compatibility, which I think on that original card I had was software based. So in the end, I think I ran it in the computer with this or, you know, with a Gus card and a Sound Blaster simultaneously because so many games didn't have native support for this and the Sound Blaster support was just so lackluster. And I think in the end, I ended up sort of giving up on the card because there was just a short period of time when it was popular and being used a lot, like kind of the 46 era. And once we got to the Pentium era, there was enough horsepower in the CPU to do all the mixing wavetable stuff that this thing does in hardware here. It was able, you were able to do that in software. So I think I ended up with a Sound Blaster 16, which carried me through quite a while until we just started getting to Windows type sound cards. And then that was that. I don't think I really played many DOS games after you know, Windows 95. So I probably just had one of those Windows sound cards and I was completely happy with that. And I don't, I don't think I even had a Sound Blaster 32 or an A32 card. Maybe I did eventually, but at that point, it was just sound cards were commodity, kind of like they are now. Like, who even cares what kind of sound you have? It just it just works, right? The sound just comes out of your motherboard. It's just a given that it's there. But in the old days, you know, there was a bit more to it, which is why cards like this existed. So let's take a closer look at this card here with the bench camera. I'll move this packing material out of the way. So there's the Pico Gus as comparison. And here is the actual Gravis Ultrasound 1.8. Freaking amazing. Serial number K114820. Says right here, designed by Advanced Gravis and Forte Technology. And it looks like the header or the plastic header connector here has been ripped off. Probably at some point this was inside a PC and it had a CD-ROM connection right there and someone yanked it off and pulls that off. It didn't damage anything. It's just the little plastic shroud is missing. And that's a sign that someone just yanked this card out when they were probably, you know, working on recycling the computer or taking it apart or doing whatever they were doing. The date there is 1994, Advanced Gravis Computer Technology. Now this particular card has a RAM expansion that's happening on here. So there's one of the, that's the onboard RAM chip. And I assume these footprints here are for additional memory, I suppose. And then we have um, this chip here, which has been inserted into there to give it the RAM expansion. And then this has a crystal audio chip here as well. And I am not really familiar with all the ins and outs of this card, but I'm wondering if this is actual hardware-based Sound Blaster and AdLib compatibility. And it looks like base port address. You can select some stuff there. Now here's the manual and it has some interesting stuff here. Ultrasound's capability or capacity to play simultaneously up to 32 notes from any combination of 32 real or digitally synthesized voices lets you use music editing software to create and mix sounds into studio quality musical arrangements. It's actually kind of interesting. One of the things, the difference between the real card here and this modern recreation of it is the what's happening in the Pico here is, you know, all of the heavy lifting that's happening in this card. But then for the audio output, it actually goes through this DAC here, which is a very high quality device, even though it's, you know, mere dollars. This is actually what's doing the digital analog conversion and it does it incredibly cleanly. There's no noise, there's no hiss, there's no background static, none of that stuff, which was very common for sound cards back in the day to pick up noise from the ISA bus and transmit it out the audio output. So I don't really remember how clean this card's gonna sound through speakers, but if it's anything like the Sound Blasters, you're probably gonna hear some amount of background noise from whatever the computer's doing on the bus that you do not get with this because of this DAC and how much isolation this thing has. It's quite amazing, to be honest, compared to vintage stuff like this. Now, looking at this manual, it's a lot of stuff about Windows and patches, and here's the DOS software. Again, I don't really know about the Sound Blaster compatibility, if this has it at all, if it's part of that crystal chip that I pointed out. It doesn't really say anything in here about that, at least that I've seen. But there's a section here talking about the Mega M, the emulator support. So this provides general MIDI, Roland MT32, Roland Sound Canvas, or Sound Blaster combination. And then there's also right here talks about SBOS or Soundboard Operating System is a driver that allows the ultrasound to run programs written for the Sound Blaster or AdLib. Looks like it emulates Sound Blaster, not Sound Blaster Pro, with the big difference between the Sound Blaster Pro and the regular being stereo sound support. Now it doesn't really talk about whether it's using hardware to do that emulation or is it just purely software? So again, I don't know about how good that is. Not that that's much of a consideration anymore, because if you're into this stuff, you're probably going to have a Sound Blaster card. You could just use that instead. I got a whole section on that Mega M emulation. It says that the sound quality is much improved over the original Sound Blaster card. So, okay. 
and I have no idea how good like the MT32 emulation with Sound Blaster support, like is it actually decent MT32 support? Probably not. I think what always falls down with the MT32 emulation is that the there are commands that games can use to really customize the sound on the MT32. I think that's what's missing most of the time with the emulation. So you just don't get the right sounds when you're playing games that take advantage of that stuff when you're using the fake MT32. Again, I don't know a whole lot about MT32 stuff. I've never owned one back in the day. I have friends that are big fans of it. There's something about the general MIDI or MT32 music that just doesn't really sit well with me. It doesn't really sound like it's computer music. And I really like the, the sampled or the FM synthesis, probably because of the ad lib stuff. And I like the sampled sound of the Amiga and obviously demos and stuff that natively use this card are gonna use sampled music. And I really like that because the, the artist that created the music, the musician is able to pick whatever instruments they want because they're using samples as opposed to like a predefined set that just all sound the same. So whenever I listen to general MIDI music, it just all sounds samey to me because there's just no variation in the instruments. And I think the MT32, of course, like I said, things can customize the sounds a lot more than you can with general MIDI. And that's where it could potentially sound far, far better. But yeah, something about me, I just, I don't know. I don't know why I really like that sample based synthesis. And now that the MT32 is not using a sample set, it's just that it's not that the artist who made the music is picking the samples from one that they've uploaded themselves, like they've created it by recording a real instrument or doing whatever, versus just picking from a patch set that's already there and that every other artist has the same access to. It just doesn't seem the same to me. And I'm probably not making any sense, but I don't know, that's just kind of my feeling. All right, so that is the Gravis Ultrasound. There is the CD that was mentioned, and let's see what else we have here. Ah, okay, it looks like this is the RAM upgrade for the Commodore 64 that was mentioned. So as I said, so you remove all of the chips off the motherboard or you socket them, and you either solder this straight onto the motherboard or you push it down into the sockets, and it basically picks up the address lines um, off, I guess, these chips on the outside, and then it picks up the data lines. There are eight bits, it's eight bit computer, so you got eight data lines, that's what you need all of these for. And then that uh, there's a little glue logic there, and I think it's SRAM chip of some kind. It's probably far more capacity than 64K. Looks like it's some kind of Cypress chip, and I can't quite read the part number on there. I've heard of some compatibility issues with this, though, because it's way faster than, obviously, like the 200 nanosecond RAM. In fact, um, the compatibility issues can come not really on the original machines. I think that generally works fine. It happens when you combine it with other FPGA-based things, like the VIC-2 Kawari, which is FPGA re-implementation of the VIC-2. And the VIC-2 graphics chip on the 64 talks directly to the RAM. That's where its well, frame buffer is, so to speak, or you know where, where it gets the graphics to draw to screen. And due to timing considerations of this versus the real RAM, I think there can be some issues. I think the thing is eventually, it will be kind of hard to find 4164 DRAM. And solutions like this, I, I think are kind of neat and just, eliminate the problem of old flaky RAM chips that haven't been made in a long time, and you can use more modern components to get your 64 working. Next up we have this, which I think this is that adapter. Yep, oh cool, it is what I was hoping it was. It was SATA to IDE. And I think these things are somewhat readily available, but yes, you plug this in here like so. It works on hard drives, of course, or solid state devices, as long as the computer you're gonna use it with supports uh, the size. And yes, it allows you to use this modern solid state drive, which you can still buy today, with any machine that uses IDE. I think the biggest problem is 250 gigabytes. It's gonna be a little big for some of these old computers, but with XT IDE, I don't think that's gonna be too much of a problem. So yes, pretty fortuitous that I got this at this exact time when I just happen to have an extra solid state drive to put into my PC. All right, let's take a look at this joystick that is a modern 3D printed recreation. Well, let's see here, that's pretty cool. It's teal pet G. Printing quality looks really, really nice. I don't really know what these types of joysticks, if you were gonna buy like a Competition Pro costs if you buy one, but uh, being able to make your own and you know, you get these types of switches and things and you have all the various little components. Oh, there it is, a PCB. This is so cool. I'll definitely put a link in the description to this. So these are the micro switches here for the joystick. And um, we still have the, this part of the joystick go in and it pushes on these. So super good quality. You can use you know as good quality or cheap reproduction ones as you want to have that awesome 
clicky feel which you get with these types of joysticks. And here is the main part of the joystick. Is This is not 3D printed, is it? No, 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 it can't be. Because this just looks, this looks like solid and frankly amazing. I, I don't really know where this comes from. Maybe this is from another joystick. It looks like these corners here are broken off. So I assume wherever this comes from has to be adapted somewhat to fit into this actual enclosure here. Ah, uh, yes, I think that's definitely the case because it looks like here you put this through like that and there it is. Yep, so <laughs> those corners got removed and you can see this bottom part here is what pushes on the uh, micro switches there. Oh, wow, that is really a nice, it's, there is no play at all in this mechanism. It is super solid, very heavy. In fact, my biggest gripe, and it's not a gripe for this design of this, I don't really love these kinds of joysticks because this, you know, you have to exert a lot of force on this to move the stick, and therefore you got to like push down on the whole joystick. It'd be better almost if it was like larger, like one of those arcade sticks. That way it would sort of sit on its own on the bench, and then you could move the joystick up and down and whatnot and have the buttons over here. You didn't have to use your hand to like really push down on the joystick. Let me figure out how to get this all assembled. There's all the screws and parts, and we even have the cable here, which has a really sweet 3D printed connector here. That is super amazing and really nice soft cord as well. Oh, because those a lot of these cheap joysticks you get these days have like really stiff PVC cord, which I really don't like. This is, this is nice. So I'm gonna take all these parts out here. Oh, they're labeled even. Okay, cool. I'm gonna figure out how to get this thing together and then it'll be a jump cut. And there we have it. The joystick is all assembled and I have play tested this on the Commodore 64 and it works really well. What's neat is on the PCB, you can configure how you want the buttons to be. So it does support two buttons, although the Commodore 64 doesn't through the single joystick port. So I actually added a small little jumper wire to make this button over here on the right, the jump or equivalent of just pushing up. And then this button is the fire button because it would be normal for me to hold this joystick like this, where at the minimum, I need the fire button here on my left hand and that button maybe has limited usefulness for me. It's probably good for people that try to use the joystick like this, but you can plug the buttons into the PCB any way you want. You can also configure them to be the same fire button, either one, so it's good for ambidextrous players. But overall, I am really impressed by the build quality, by everything about this. It feels incredibly solid. I only have some very small criticisms. Uh, one of them is that these two screws, it'd be nice if they were more up in the corners here, there's probably a reason I didn't really pay close attention why they're there. But the problem with them being here is the case, as you can see, actually bends a little bit when you push it together. Now that shouldn't really be a problem, but if you're holding the joystick like this or like this and you move this, you can actually feel that. Like I have my pinky finger kind of resting there on that seam and moving the joystick actually does sort of push it together a little bit. So it kind of closes the gap. It's a little bit distracting. And my other only slight criticism is that this joystick mechanism here is very strongly sprung. I mean, it feels incredibly solid. I think this was much better suited to like an arcade cabinet or a large arcade stick where you're not having to hold down the entire joystick just to use it. Because as it sits right now, it's impossible to move this without essentially holding this down pretty firmly to the table. Otherwise, you know, if you try to move this left, right, up and down or whatever, it just moves the whole joystick. I wouldn't be surprised if there are different versions of this that you can buy that maybe are more lightly sprung, but I personally would love to see an arcade stick base that could take all of these components, the PCB, the buttons, the joystick, everything, and make it in a larger 3D printed case. That way you could just rest your hand on it, get the fire buttons like this, and then you wouldn't have to hold this down so hard onto your desk. That is really my biggest complaint with this style of joystick. It's not just this one, but all of them. I just don't like having to hold it down on the desk to use it, which is why I prefer to use game pads. Even with those criticisms though, don't get me wrong, I'm very impressed with the whole quality of this thing. This thing feels really awesome and nice, and it's amazing that this thing was assembled with 3D printed parts. I don't know for sure if all these parts are available to download, the building materials, the PCB Gerbers, and the STLs for the 3D printing. If they are, I'll put a link in the description below so you can try your hand at making one of these joysticks yourself. Okay, we still have some more stuff here to take a look at. These are gonna be some of those PCBs that were mentioned in the letter. So these are just sort of random parts. Okay, so first off, the Pico postcard. What a freaking nice PCB, this ENG coating on here. Much better than the stuff that I usually make. 
I typically, if I have one of these made myself, I always get this really cheap coating here, which can wear off and actually go inside your slots and everything. This is obviously a much better way to do it. So the Pi Pico would go there, which I'm assuming we have an assembled one of them right there to look at. This right here, I wouldn't be surprised if this is a Commodore 64 power supply voltage selection. So I think there's like a switch mode power supply that would go right here for five volts. And then we have the AC transformer there and the connectors. And I think this probably fits with, within the standard C64 brick. And there it is, C64 PSU Global. So that's pretty nice. I have to admit, I've never used one of these PCBs. I just build my own. I 3D print a little case. I use an old Linksys nine volt AC one amp power supply that I just like have in my junk drawer and a regular five volt switchy switch mode power supply. And then you end up with a replacement C64 power supply. Some of the things that this has that it doesn't, it looks like it has a fuse holder there. It looks like this thing has facilities for a panel meter to show your five volts there. Uh, this is the output. We have the mains input right there. It looks like we have a selector switch and I guess the transformer part number, like maybe one of these here. The, these are where the connections go from the transformer and this is some kind of switch mode power supply that goes in there, a little module. Looking at this PCB, this looks like a dual SID PCB. I'm assuming, yeah, SID 1, SID 2. Looks like it takes a GAL and a 4053, which is an analog switch, a 4052, these are some, I don't know, CMOS type chips. External signals, so you do need some extra address line signals sent to this little PCB so you can address both of the SIDs. Looks like some various jumpers and some other components. I have to admit, I've never tried a dual SID board before. I've tried dual SID and some of my more modern 64 FPGA type systems, but I've never used a PCB. There's not very much stuff that supports dual SIDs. It's mainly demos and SID tracks that are like composed specifically for dual SID. I don't think there's any period correct games that use two SIDs for the stereo sound output or just additional channels really. It still sounds cool and all, but I've just never felt the need to put one of these in any of my 64s. All right, and this PCB, I can tell right here, this is from Mark at the Retro Channel. This is his RF modulator replacement PCB for longboards. And uh, he did a great job designing finally a new one of these where the video signal that's output is really as good as possible. Like he uses oscilloscope to really fine tune all the components here just to well, give you adjustability with some adjustments on here to give you the best possible video output. Check out his channel, the Retro Channel, if you haven't already. He has a bunch of great videos on building these things up and the video quality improvements you get from your 64. And yes, in case you're not familiar, the RF modulator on the 64, it doesn't just output the RF signal to your old school TV. It's actually what takes the chroma luma signal out of the VIC chip and converts that to the correct levels to go to your monitor as S-video type signal. And it also creates the composite video that goes out as well. So using these replacement boards actually provide quite a big improvement in the video quality because the RF modulator on the motherboard doesn't do the best job. I've made a video before where I made a few mods to the stock onboard modulator, which improved the video signal, at least on NTSC models. But one of the problems is there's a whole bunch of different modulators and they're all a bit different inside. So these types of modern replacements is just something that's pretty nice to get that old one out of there and get better video quality from your system. Looks like he has a hard reset circuit that's added on as well, which uh, does a little trickery that helps reset your 64 uh, properly as opposed to some software won't let you reset out of it. So that's pretty cool. This little board here is the Pico Post remote board. So it takes the OLED screen and I squared C that goes over to the Pico Post. And uh, what's this here? A little USB connector of some kind. We've got some buttons to manipulate the GUI, I guess, graphical user interface on the Pico Postcard. I think it has options for like looking at postcode history and maybe selecting your BIOS, stuff like that. I'm not too sure, I haven't used it yet, but uh, that's just the little blank PCB that goes with that. And then the final PCB here is the Amiga four player adapter. I guess I wasn't really aware that this was a thing. It plugs into the parallel port, gives you two additional joystick ports, including some auto fire stuff. Oops, there's a dip switch there for setting things up. And there must have been some period correct games that supported extra joysticks through the parallel port. If you have any experience playing games that use those extra joysticks, definitely let me know. I have to say, I've never tried any of them. And here it is, the final thing to look at before we start testing things in the bench computer. And this is the Pico Post. And there it is, fully assembled. So the Pi Pico is soldered right onto the board there. We have some uh, level shifters, things like that. 
Here's the SATA connector that goes through this cable here to this little OLED screen module. It does also have a, an IC there. Obviously power is carried over this. What's really awesome about these SATA cables is they're dirt cheap. These connectors are widely available and this is really good for super high speed signals. These connectors can break, so they're a little bit fragile, but you see this cable is the kind that has a little locking connector on it and it allows for good high speed signal integrity over a very inexpensive transport. Uh, when I was talking to the Pico Post guys, one of my suggestions was adding a speaker because you probably see me use this card many times on the channel. This is one of those inexpensive ones you get from China and it does have a speaker right on board. And I just leave this wire attached because when I go to troubleshoot, it really does help to have that speaker on board. So it would have been neat, just a neat addition, just to add the speaker with a header, nothing else. You don't need any like anything to power it up or whatever, just a passive little component there that just would add that extra functionality for people like me who use these types of boards in systems for testing a lot of things. I also actually suggested that it'd be nice if the OLED screen could optionally be connected directly to the board. Like maybe this would be like a little break off PCB or something. So you didn't have to have it hanging off with this because I use this all the time for the testing and this isn't something I'm gonna permanently install into a computer. It's just something I'm constantly using. So for quality of life for someone like me, having the screen integrated along with um, the speaker would be extra awesome. I think that's enough talking from me. Let's test out some of this stuff. All right, 46 DX266 test bench is out. I have an XT IDE ROM card in here. I have an IDE card with my compact flash card. So I have local bus video and we have the Pico Gus installed. Let's just see if everything is working here with the Gravis ultrasound before we switch over to the real card. Let's try Pinball Fantasies. Now, unfortunately, I can't run Second Reality Demo, which is what I really like to run. And that's because the music on that is entirely copyrighted. So I'll get a copyright strike right away. So we're gonna pick Gravis Ultrasound on here and press any key. We should have music that works. And this is like the Amiga version of the game, I think. There we go. All right, let's load up a level here. And interesting is the Pico Gus has a little LED that flashes on here to tell you it's being talked to from the software. So that's kind of a cool diagnostic aid. So let's see here. I forgot how to play this. Shift key, yep, yeah, shift keys. Whoa. Okay, so there's a delay on my capture device from when I see it. So that's not great for games like this. But obviously it's working. We have proper sound and everything. Let's exit out of this. Oh, let me turn this volume down. That was very loud. Okay, so it's all working. Let's switch over to the real ultrasound. I'm assuming I'm gonna need to install something, I guess. So I just checked in the manual and this is set for 240 according to the way the jumpers are configured here. So that is actually the same as how this is configured. So I'm just gonna install this right into the computer and let's see what happens. So for sound output, this jack right here is the line output. Now this card is long, so I can't install it over the CPU. So it's gonna have to sit right next to the video card there, but that should be no issue just like that. And here we go, let's power it up. Three, two, one, system powered on normally. That's a good sign. Now, obviously the Pico Gus init utility, that's not gonna work, but there is an ultrasound environment variable, which I think should work with the way this card is configured here. So I just really need to take that Pico Gus setup thing out. And there you go, it says Pico Gus not detected. So that's fine. So if we look at the environment variables, there it is, ultrasound is 241155. I don't know if that's the right stuff for this card, but let's see what happens. All right, looks like it's frozen up. So I think there might be some utilities that do the initial setup of this card that I will need to get onto this compact flash card and run. So let me go figure that out and we'll try this again. All right, so I actually got the Gravis ultrasound working. I figured out the right settings, but I noticed a little bit of a problem in this area of the board. I thought I smelled something a little, well, not so good. And uh, yeah, we have some serious cap leakage going on there. So I'm gonna try to clean this thing up. I think this board will first need to get a good wash and then um, I'll remove these two caps here and swap them out. Nichicon, yep, but it's from the 90s and even Nijikon caps turned into crap in the 90s. So 470 microfarad, 16 volts. I think I got some of those. And now take a look at the Gravis ultrasound. It looks freaking fantastic, as good as new. I replaced these two caps here and I used some vinegar to clean up all that little bit of corrosion that had formed and then gave it a good scrubbing and washing with soap just to get all that 
goopy electrolyte off. And uh, yeah, now it looks really good. These are the two caps that I removed from the board. As you can see, they're in very sad shape. These are VZ series Nichicons. And in case you're wondering about replacing all of the caps on this board, I really don't think it's necessary. Generally, what I do is if there are some caps that are leaking, I'll replace all the caps that are in the same series. So if any of these other caps were VZ, I'd also look to replace those. And luckily, all of the caps that are on this board, except for those two that are right there, are a different series. So they're probably going to be fine. But if one of these started to leak, then you'd want to replace all the other caps in the same series. It seems like caps in the 90s started to become, well, kind of inferior quality. And generally, the same series of caps all seem to kind of fail at the same time. So if you have a Gravis ultrasound, you should definitely check to see if there's any leakage up in this area here. That's probably an audio amplifier. And what caused me to think that there was a cap problem on this board is that I got it working. I'll talk about the configuration changes I did to get that working. And then I had it playing some music and then I started hearing this weird high pitched oscillation coming from the card, even when there was no sound. And if I touched the board, it would change in frequency, which really screams that there's something going on with the capacitors. And then I just took a look right here and I was like, uh oh. And I wouldn't be surprised if people watching this video when I unbox the card probably noticed that. I really was just paying attention to all the dust and I wasn't noticing that there was a bunch of green crap up in this one corner. Either way, the card is all clean and it's ready to go back in this machine and I can demonstrate it that it does fully function. So there were two main reasons why this card wasn't working. Let's go to autoexec.bat. And originally when I was first testing, I was just using the Pico Gus configuration here. So I had this ultrasound variable set and obviously the Pico Gus setup utility wasn't gonna work. And I just tried to use the card, not realizing that you have to initialize this card as well. So I reached out to Ian Scott, the creator of the Pico Gus, and I asked what it would take to use a regular Gus card, a real Gus card in my computer. And Ian let me know that I needed uh, some utilities that came with the original install CD for the Gus. Well, instead of getting that CD out and trying to extract the DOS utilities, Ian just sent me a zip file, which I copied onto this compact flash card. And in that ultrasound directory, which I now have on this compact flash card, they use the ultra init program right there. Um, ignore the fact that I have a capital T there. That is uh, just a typo there. So ultra init to initialize your card. But the regular ultrasound only really needs this ultrasound variable here. So base IO 240. And these are the DMA channel stuff and yet it still wasn't working. Well, I took a look at the note that Nora sent and Nora mentioned that I also needed the ultra 16 environment variable C manual. So I went into the manual that was included here and sure enough, it said I needed this information right here to be added as a variable and then that should get the card working. And sure enough, you can see here after booting there, it says ultrasound initialization version 2.28a and all is working. So now if we run pinball fantasies, just like we did before, uh, any other key to proceed? Oh, I keep pushing the wrong button. Okay, Gravis Ultrasound. I think we should be working now. I haven't exactly tested this yet. We're doing this for the first time. There it is. Yes, we have music. So yeah, cool. This card is um, absolutely working in this game, at least. And we'll slow it up the same level we played earlier on. Now this has, I think, 8-bit sound from the Amiga. It's not using any kind of 16-bit sound. But, but yeah, there we go. It freaking works. Awesome. And I also have Cubic Player configured for the Gravis Ultrasound because I was using it on the Pico Gus for testing and stuff like that. So let's just pick a random module file. This has 25 channels here. It sounds amazing. So there it is, the Gravis Ultrasound. And I don't know what else there is to say other than, well, it's a Gravis Ultrasound. These cards are very, very expensive. They're cool at what they do. So if you're playing demos from that period in the 90s, like 93, 94, 95, these cards work really well for that. It just seems like stuff that was out in 96 and 97 and whatnot work perfectly well with the Soundblaster 16 and it uses software mixing inside the CPU. So you need a 
a Pentium or something faster than a 486 and all will work well. But this card does work well and that's really awesome. It's good for testing and it's a real thing. The Pico Gus though is still a freaking awesome card. And if you don't have a Gravis Ultrasound, well, I kind of recommend just getting one of these and skipping the entire expense of getting one of these because the reality is the Pico Gus is gonna work just as well. It's modern. It also does a bunch of other sound cards because you could just switch the firmware. I mean, I don't know what else to say other than this is a fantastic project, which really, other than the sampling that this thing has, this thing does everything else just as well. Well, better in fact, it has MIDI output and you can even plug a USB on the go cable into this and use a freaking Xbox 360 controller as a PC joystick. Yes, instead of plugging an analog joystick into here, you can use an Xbox 360 joystick in on the Raspberry Pi Pico and it freaking works. That was something I was recently testing for Ian and the Xbox controller was working well. I couldn't get the wireless controller working, but the wired USB version did work perfectly. All right, so let's test out this. This is the Pico Post. So we'll pop that in and just for comparison's sake, I'm going to plug in this, which is my actual postcard that I generally use. And just for fun, I have a period correct postcard. This one's actually kind of fancy because it tells you also if any interrupts trigger or DMA channels. So that's kind of nice and has a clear button here to clear any of the LEDs there. So this came out in the 90s and it's a true diagnostic aid. And we're gonna put these all in here together to take a look at what we see. So I'm gonna rearrange here so we can more easily see those displays. Hopefully that will give us visibility into all of the displays. And then this right here, the OLED screen is for the Pico Post. So I'm just gonna hold that and let's turn this thing on. Okay, so um, this thing here says select port. And let me zoom in on that. So you have to get this in focus. Hello, focus, there we go. So it boots up and it's asking for me to select the different ports. So 80, 84, 90, 300, and 378. 80 is the standard port. And if we zoom back out, you can see here that we have FF, FF, because the system is already booted and this is not displaying anything. Let's hit the reset button here. Okay, so there we have five and E, F. Okay, so did you see that? This was displaying something that didn't quite make sense. And this is something that I noticed is happening with this. So I did a little bit of testing off camera and I noticed that occasionally, like this is just sitting here at FF, system is booted, but sometimes I'd see like zero, zero on this and like other stuff happening which doesn't really make sense. Like nothing should be happening on this thing at all right now. It should just be displaying the last code. Now, the funny thing is, is currently it seems to be working, but if I plug the Gravis ultrasound back into the machine or the Pico Gus for that matter, and I play some music, I guess there's a lot of IO port activity and occasionally this will erroneously display stuff that doesn't really make sense. Now let's test this in an actual diagnostic scenario. So we'll turn the power off there and let's pull this RAM out of here so the system can't boot. Now for post activity to work, you need a functional BIOS ROM and you need a CPU that's actually executing code. If I remove this, you're never gonna have any post codes. And if the CPU is not working, you're not gonna have any post codes either. So we're gonna turn this on and it should get stuck because of the RAM check. So five, okay. C1, so that's obviously the error that we're having. So this is one of my, okay, I'm gonna turn that off. This is one of the problems I think I have with this thing is it doesn't remember the last thing you set. So I had it set for 80, power cycle the computer, and then it's gone. So it doesn't actually show any postcodes until you actually select something. So that means I have to turn on the power, select what I want, and then reset the machine, which is not, not exactly ideal. So we'll select that. Okay, so that's there, right there. So it should be displaying C1, and it has a C1 there, but then it also has two extra codes there. So let's hit reset. So five is right. And there's C1, and now there's a 96. So there definitely seems to be something kind of strange happening with this device. Now, it's a software-defined card, so this could well just be a firmware problem and nothing more than that. So maybe I just need to update the firmware. Let's put the RAM back in. There it is, so I'll select, uh, <laughs> I'll select it there. Okay, so it's booting up. 
I uh, can't really see that one, but there it is, 31. So that all matches, 53, 61. But look, that's displaying zero, zero right now. The FF is all the way back there. So there's like spurious things being picked up by this. So while we have this booted, let's take a look at some of the other stuff that this thing can do. So we can hit back. So besides this, um, we have voltage rail and uh, five volts, 12 volts, and then that. So that's not quite working. Now you can see right there, there's some voltage dividers. Something's going on with the firmware or maybe there's a component that's not installed correctly on the board because uh, I measured the minus 12 volt rail. It's like minus 11.7 on the power supply. So there's no actual fault. This is something going on with this. We also have an info screen here. So there it is, Pico Post 042. Now I reached out to the folks on Discord who are working on this and they mentioned that, yeah, I might have an old firmware or there could be some problems on the board here. So I'll need to uh, check to see if there's any updates. Now, the other thing that's kind of interesting is it supports these additional IO ports for diagnostics. So I think 84 is used for compacts, 90 must use for the IBM PS2, ESA systems, 300H, and then Olivetti, I think is 378. Now, I have found that on my Chinese postcard here, this actually responds to 80, 84, and 300. It does all three. I did a little bit of testing using the DOS debug program to find those. I always just assumed it was using port 80, but no, it turned out it used these extra ports as well. Now, this card, on the other hand, only responds to 80. It doesn't respond to anything else. And the funny thing is about these other two IO ports is that occasionally I'll stick this into an XT and an XT doesn't have postcode. So this card just shows nothing. But it seems like something in the XT BIOS is either writing to 84 or 300 and this is displaying stuff. Like it's sort of random, it's not helpful, but at least tells you that the system is working. Now, this is interesting. This thing has gone into like a screensaver there, a little bit of a flying toaster. That's a cute touch. I'm gonna hit the reset button. And reset didn't do anything. Oh, I know why, because this is actually, I think it's in the menu, right? So let's pick the compact one. And the compact one, well, it says 3B there. Now, the thing is, this card responds to compact stuff as well. So let's hit reset. And you can see this thing is kind of going through the motion and this thing is just staying at zero. But then it just did a few things there. And I think those were spurious um, inputs to this. All right, so I stuck that in a little thing there so I don't have to hold it because we're gonna use the DOS debug program to actually test what's going on here. So currently it's set for the compact thing. So you can type O for out, 84 for the IO port, and then I can put like AA. And there it is. So that shows AA, that shows AA, and the other card here, if I zoom out, this one doesn't show anything because that's only responding to port 80. Now, if you write to port 80 and I'm gonna write BB to it, then we have BB here, BB there, but this one is only looking at 84, so it's not showing anything at all. But if I write to 84 and I do CC, then there we go, that displays CC and that displays CC. So that definitely seems to be responding to that particular IO port. So let's go down to the PS2 port here. So this is port 90. I'm gonna out port 90 and I'm gonna send DD to it. And there it is. So this doesn't respond to that, nor does that, but there's DD. So we know that this is definitely responding to port 90 without issue. Now we're gonna check out 300, that's the ESA port. And I'm gonna to write to that 300 and we'll write uh, EE to that. And that shows EE, but this is not decoding anything at all. Now, I'm definitely not blaming anything right here because this could be a firmware issue. This could also be a problem with like some of the address lines that are on the board here. Maybe they're not wired up properly. Maybe there's a bad solder joint. It's really hard to say. But if we write uh, 2, 2 to that address, there we go, that changed to 2, 2. That doesn't do anything and that's not seeing anything either. And let's try 378, which is the Olivetti port. And we'll do out, out 378 and we'll put 3, 3. And unfortunately, that's not decoding anything either, nor are these. So 378 is something that the Chinese card definitely does not support. Now, actually, the way I did testing on this card here to figure out which of the I.O. ports it did support is I wrote a little program in BASIC. And BASIC on the PC actually allows you to write to the I.O. ports. And I just did a for loop and I just wrote to all the I.O. ports, you know, one at a time. And I printed on screen what was being sent to the I.O. port. And I would just note when this changed. And that's how I figured out that it actually supports those three ports which honestly is something I didn't realize because the documentation that comes with this card doesn't even talk about anything to do with IO ports at all. It just calls it a post analyzer card. But just know that if you buy one of these cards, I'm sure they're all absolutely identical 
and it does support those three addresses. So here's the Pico Post GitHub page. So if you want to try to make one of these or actually contribute to the project, definitely check this out. Looks like they have quite a bit of stuff that they are working on that talks about what this thing does, it's kind of as I already mentioned. There's a wish list here talking about stuff that they want to try to implement in this firmware, and it's all totally possible because of the way this is a software-defined card. I think for fun, what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch up all the joints that are on these. These are level shifters, these three ICs here, plus everything that connects the PI Pico to the board here. And let's see if that results in any improvement, at least for the uh, higher address decoding for those postcodes. Okay, I touched up all the solder joints. I didn't see any that were actually not good anyways. And I just sent an out of FF to this and on 300 that is, and it didn't work. So that didn't fix it. It could be one of those transceivers is still bad. It could be the Pi Pico itself that's bad. Maybe like a diagnostic mode would be really helpful for the firmware to show the activity of all the address lines that are coming into the Pi Pico, just so you know that that's not the problem, that you have an issue with the transceiver or the Pico itself or whatever. So maybe, so maybe an activity display for all the eight data bits and then all the address lines that are routed to the Pico. I don't actually know how many are routed to it, but uh, yeah, that would be, that'd be kind of useful because, so whatever the issue is with this, I think it's probably a hardware problem or maybe it's a PCB issue. This is a version 1.0 of the PCB. Even with the issues I'm having with this particular project, I still think it's pretty cool to have something like this because because it is a software defined card, there's a lot of flexibility and capabilities that can be added to this thing to display all sorts of other information that's happening on your bus. And I think that's actually really quite cool. And there's a lot of possibilities. So if you are a programmer or a hardware person and you wanna kind of contribute to this, then please go over to the GitHub here and get on the Discord as well and chat with the developers of this thing because um, I think this thing has promise and it just needs a little bit more time in the oven. So I think I'm gonna end this mail call video here. Nora, thank you so much for sending this Gravis Ultrasound Max. I am totally honored to have such an awesome card and an expensive card as this. And finally, I can do some good A to B comparison with the Pico Gus and this, if we ever run into any incompatibility issues with specific software on certain motherboards and things like that. And thanks again for sending in the adapter for the SATA devices and this awesome 3D printed joystick all the way from Finland. That is freaking awesome. I am so blessed to have the nicest viewers who are just so incredible to donate all this amazing stuff to me. So huge thanks to everyone who sent in stuff for the mail call. Nora, of course, thank you again for all this stuff. And if you haven't seen the things you've sent in on mail call yet on the video, don't worry, I'm getting to them. It just takes me a while to do it. Uh, thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up over here on the side of the screen. They get early access to videos and they make it possible that I do this full time. So a huge thanks. I'm so indebted to them. It's absolutely a stunning and amazing thing that people are so generous. And then all the usual YouTube junk. So thumbs up, subscribe, all this stuff like that. Subscribing really, really helps me out. I mean, that one thing, it's just like a second to click that button. And uh, on both my channels, if you're watching and you're not subscribed, I really, really, really would appreciate it if you did. But and with that, that is it for this video. So stay healthy, stay safe. I'll see you next time. Bye.